Yeah, first of all, of course, thank you for having me and thank you for hosting this wonderful uh, focus on 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 uh, empathy and and feelings. So um, I'll be trying to, as you can see, uh, and to trace the the fate of sentimental pictures between the Weg like height. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and I'm feeling. Uh, and, and to approach a definition and especially a discussion of of uh, these pictures and the issue of sentimentality. It's based on a current research project in Denmark that I'm doing together with a, a museum <coughs> uh, hosting both Dutch and, and Danish paintings. So it's focused on this genre, namely genre painting. So people, paintings of everyday life in, in the broader sense. Um, so um, <clears throat> usually one will find a statement like this by Marcia Mulder Eaton, quote, sentimental art is not only bad, uh, is not bad only because of its ethical defects. It lacks intrinsic features that reward sustained attention and reflection. No long-term delight or satisfaction is forthcoming, end of, end of quote. So it's really a, a tough judgment, one might say. Um, and I'll try to perhaps question that a bit and, and, and open a, a discussion. Um, <clears throat> and, and to do that, I need to go a bit back in time and to look at empathy. Because normally, if you think of the theme of empathy, normally, of course, we empathy gives positive connotation and, and holds positive uh, associations. So, um, <clears throat> Art that has been traditionally connected with empathy has usually been valued highly. Um, and the same goes for art that triggers a certain way of a certain absorption uh, um, in, in the in the uh, in the picture. So one could think of, say, the early uh, the high Middle Ages where around um, the 1300s you had a small revolution in emotions. you had a more realistic, um, way of depicting the the, uh, the passion of Christ and um, and his suffering and, and Virgin Mary's of course uh, loss. Uh, so you suddenly have a, a new style and and one might talk of course of empathy in in that sense that we are um, able to empathize with the subject and we are and the the, the way it, in which the, it has been depicted makes that really possible. Uh, that it seems like, uh, yeah, as I said, a realistic <coughs> uh, representation. So that is around 1300 and and also a bit later in the ren early Renaissance. You see Oshi van der Weyden's uh, The Descent from the Cross, a very famous painting because of its realism, because of the, pic the, the mourners have been individualized and uh, and because of these strong emotions that are being transmitted in the in the work, and uh, art historian David Friedberg has uh, often centered on, on this work, noting that it is really a case of empathy, and and in his version, a bodily empathy that we can uh, simply empathize with these movements um, of of the people. And my last uh, <coughs> uh, exhibit. Um, is is uh, Giotto's Lamentation of Christ, so uh, where you have again individualized features um, that um, and and a strong sense of uh, engagement and a kind of collective mourning. So you see, for instance, the angels that they have uh, really individual expressions. Um, <clears throat> of course, we're not here dealing with a modern psychological sense of emotions, but we are kind of widening the the scope of what can be uh, what can be told and and of course it, it really is a, a strong trigger for for empathy so uh, if you follow, follow patricia simons and charles Sique, they say quote lomazzo an italian a scholar on the emotions followed the conventional line that viewers usually identify with the depicted mood or subject they would be stirred to fury when beholding a lively battle scene or would be afflicted with a fellow feeling that is empathy would be aroused a male viewer would be moved to desire a beautiful young woman for his wife when he sees her painted naked. Viewers would be stirred with disdain and wrath 
at the site of shameful dishonest actions. Lomanzo described an imitative response at length, but we must remember that those were in actuality far from literal. But what still underlies this statement is the, the issue of empathy that we are also suddenly in the Renaissance seeing uh, people theorizing as emotions and valuing this fellow feeling or empathy. So suddenly it becomes both part of the art theory, so to speak, of the period, and it becomes an actual um, project in, in the paintings to, to achieve empathy. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, and also in the architect and, well, universal genius, Leon Battista Alberti, he has a famous quote, uh, the painting will move the soul of the beholder when the people painted there are each clearly shows the movement of his own soul. We weep with the weeping, laugh with the laughing, and grieve with the grieving. These movements of the soul are known from the movements of the body. That is also quite important for Friedberg's project, but that's uh, another matter. But um, so we see a kind of a small revolution in empathy around first uh, thir 13th, uh, the 13th, and the 14th uh, uh, <coughs> around those uh, periods, uh, those two centuries. Um, and um, if we move on a bit to the, the, the Baroque or, or the 17th century, the 1600s, we have a, a term, Beweglichkeit, that a scholar of, a scholar of the emotions, uh, Hermann Rodenburg, has uh, focused on. And he's saying that, quote, as the specialists now seem to agree, the term Beweglichkeit bore double connotation. It referred both to the liveliness of the emotions depicted and to their ability to induce emotions to touch the heart of the beholder, unquote. So he is especially dealing with the case of Rembrandt, that he has this uh, amazing ability to both depict emotion, uh, sorry, depict motion and trigger uh, emotion with his uh, paintings. And it's, of course, uh, well, well known that that especially the Dutch paintings of, of that century, especially genre painting, but also history painting, uh, managed to convey a sense of empathy. So this is actually a painting we'll be uh, borrowing for for the exhibition. So that's quite uh, uh, amazing that we can can get hold of these masterpieces. Uh, so uh, a girl is actually uh, delizing deal, um, the, the monks here. So it's a as a symbol of care and of also of of empathy. Um, in Copenhagen, we have this uh, painting, one of my favorites, uh, where you see the case of absorption, that absorption suddenly being valued uh, or ex explored in by painters, uh, especially in the Dutch uh, and Flemish uh, areas uh, and localities. So um, and. So from the Middle Ages until the early modern period, we have a kind of strong sense of emerging empathy culture, um, both in art theory and in the actual works. And one might also, uh, this is my final example of this, uh, go back to Michael Fried and his study of, of absorption and theatricality. So he's, of course, saying that a painter like Chardin is uh, drawing inspiration from the, these exact and, and actually heightening or intensifying the uh, the project that was uh, put into motion with uh, the Dutch painters. Um, and this can be called really a modern phenomenon, early modern phenomenon. So in his famous book, he focuses on absorption as being kind of an early modern path to, um, yeah, well, in reality, modern painting. So, uh, and the same goes for Robert uh, Fischer, uh, German uh, aesthetician who famously uh, introduced the idea of Einfühlung or expanded on the idea of Einfühlung and giving it a new sense. So he said, quote, thus I project my own life into the lifeless form just as I quite justifiably do with another living person. Only ostensibly do I keep my own identity although the object remains distinct. I see merely to adapt and attach myself to it as one one hand, one hand flaps clasps another, and yet are mysteriously transplanted and magically transformed into this other." Unquote. So again, a, 
even further, it goes even further in widening the idea of empathy. Now it's also simply a projection into into the the artwork and the surroundings. Um, so, and that might that might be said to be the culmination of of empathy in that uh, artist art historical investigation. So the problem is somehow sentimental paintings break with uh, that bond of empathy, um, and one. One of the reasons might be that they are programmatic, that they are deliberately targeting emotions and they are deliberately, um, well, uh, created to trigger certain emotions. And uh, philosopher uh, William Lyons has made a list of seven, well, ways in which emotions can be connected to artworks. And he's mentioning paintings as his main, uh, and his, as his main, focus. So you'll see in number four, emotion generated through the painting. The painter may set out via his painting, but not via the depiction of expression in it, of some emotion, to generate a particular emotion or emotions in a viewer. So there's a calculated um, well, ambition to trigger certain emotions in the viewer. And he expands on that saying that, <clears throat> quote, on the four, emotion generated through a painting I want to consider those paintings that have been quite clearly designed as a medium for listing emotions in the viewer. The archetypes here are the genre paintings of the Victorian era in England and Scotland. Think of all those paintings of poor peasants being evicted from their tenant cottages by cruel landlords, or the foreign fields littered with the carnage of brave cavalrymen, or those acres of beds with wan figures trying, so gasping their last breaths, surrounded by their stricken families." Unquote. So all this can be summed up as sentiment, sentimentality, as, a, as an artistic phenomenon. And one painter in, in particular might be said to be the, the actual instigator of this, and that is Jean-Baptiste Groes, who really caused a small revolution in French painting by painting such as this one, where you have, uh, you can see the, all the attention of all the, the beholders in the painting are focused on uh, the uh, paralyzed uh, family father. Uh, in the center of the picture. Um, and this was bought by Empress Catherine the Great of Russia. So so you can see how, how highly valued uh, sentimentality actually was at the time. Um, and even more interesting is Goyce's famous uh, A Girl Weeping Over Her Dead Bird uh, that really caused a, a, a kind of a Excitement, a lot of excitement at the Paris Salon. And Diderot mentioned that it was simply a, a wonderful and and really uh, <clears throat> effective work. So, and today it might be difficult to see that. Today, this kind of painting has become, uh, well, not even, I wouldn't even say problematic, but simply kitschy, simply uh, not part of the elite sense of, of art and art history. Um, so, how is that? How did we end up in that? situation. And of course you have a lot of similar paintings and especially as Lyons is mentioning in the Victorian period you have here's a, it's a boy but you can see it's more than 100 years later. Now it's a boy uh, grieving his his, uh, <coughs> his bird. Um, it can be a dog mourning his uh, his or her master. Um, uh, as there's only a coffin in this painting so, uh, but still a, a close kind of connection. Or it could be an early a woman who's been uh, widowed early on. So the wedding dress. Uh, so here you only have objects that are simply the the actual uh, composition, part of the actual message of, of the paintings. So the problem is, if we go back to Eaton's statement, that sentimental art is not bad only because of its ethical defects. It lacks, it lacks intrinsic features that reward sustained attention and re reflection. Uh, no long-term delight or satisfaction is forthcoming. But, but so that's a quite the opposite of what was the case at the Salon in the uh, late 1700s. And my question is, um, are we talking, are we talking about sympathy or empathy? Because uh, Lyons also mentions a famous genre work, Millais, uh, the Blind Girl, that was also a very popular painting at the time. So a blind girl is uh, <clears throat> seen together probably with her sister and, and she 
only the title suggests that, that she cannot see, but she has closed eyes. And then you have a double rainbow in the background, so almost an insult to the poor girl. And Lyons finds this over the top, that it's simply too much. Uh, and and you, it could be seen as an allegory of the senses also, that you see birds would be noise from those birds and so on. You could see she is grasping as some, some of the grass and so on. Uh, but it was quite a popular and fashionable type of painting at that point. And a uh, historian of Victorian painting, Pamela Fletcher, has said that what was aimed at was paintings, quote, full of genuine emotion or filled with human feelings. So uh, in, in actuality, um, um, it was a very uh, unspecific feeling. It was not really, it was a kind of meta feeling that is behind sentimentality. It's one, not one particular, but a sense of engagement or interest. Uh, but there were limits to that kind of sentimentality. This painting in memoriam was memorizing a ma massacre on, on, on English women, British women in India the year before. And it, and it caused a scandal. It was simply too much and it was also too contemporary uh, to be shown uh, in, a, in a painting. You can see in the background some act actually Scottish Highlanders are shown, but the, originally it, were, it was Indians. They had to be painted out afterwards by by Payton to make the picture more sellable. Uh, so that was too much for the Victorian taste, actually. Uh, that was going too far. And um, and F Fletcher is saying that, quote, modern psychologists and philosophers distinguish between empathy and sympathy on the grounds of judgment and connection to potential action. Empathy, I feel your pain, versus sympathy, I feel pity for your pain. While the term itself entered the English, English language in the early 20th century, the distinction is interesting because this was precisely where some Victorians drew the line. So, is it because these pictures are really only about sympathy and not about empathy that we are not really engaged in the action and we are at a safe distance from the action depicted? That could be one of the questions. Um, and lastly, um, one might consider the level of action or the level of passivity in the paintings, but here I'm not talking about absorption. We're not dealing about dealing with with the persons who are absorbed in activities as such. But many of the Dutch uh, paintings uh, from the 1600s uh, have a lot of activity and sometimes fights and brawls and so on taking place. Here, the children are spoiling the ruining the the, the meal in a way, but in a funny way. Um, in this, children are being cared for, so this could also be called sentimental, but if this is not sentimental, then there must be some reasons for, for that. But you, the reasons could be that there's a, actually a lot, lot of activity going on, uh, and the, uh, the, the figures have been connected and linked with uh, chains of, of, of movement. Uh, unlike, so I've, I've simply taken two Danish examples of, of, of sentimental pictures, and these were also highly sought after, bought by the royal family, by the nobility, by the sculptor Thorvaldsen, who has his own museum in Copenhagen. So they were really well-known artists at the time and then completely fell from grace. Um, so you'll see children are afraid of something. We cannot see what. It's outside of the picture frame, but there might be an in incoming storm. Uh, but you can see there's not really a correspondence between the anxiety and the phenomenon. They are in a way too anxious of, of something that is not that really that dangerous or not really that present. Uh, and they are also passive. They are not doing anything. Uh, and they are placed in a kind of imaginary or a bit idealized maybe or empty landscape. The same with this one. Two poor children. So the title is very uh, telling. They are simply in the forest gathering wood um, and they have a dog with them. But they are again standing still and not doing anything, and just, and in this case, looking out to us as beholders. Um, funnily, the composition is remarkably close to, to this famous work of, of a landowner, but that wasn't known at the time, so it must be simply a convention that, that the artist Larsen here is, is, is using. But the point is that these children are passive, they are not really responsible for their own existence and they are left to chance to happenstance uh, and are not capable of um, of reacting or responding so we have a kind of modern 
feeling anxiety but it's not really um doesn't really uh, correspond to the uh, to any serious phenomenon it's simply not serious enough that would be one of the complaints about uh, sentimentality it's simply not worth depicting it's not a monumental or it's not existential like say the scream by Monk or something like that it, it doesn't hold those kind of, of of emotions but i think the lack of activity is also significant so first the lack of of empathy actually and the lack of of uh, action uh, in the paintings and uh, especially in paintings of children and um, lastly i can uh, point to a discussion by, by quoting james elkins who said quote these days we resist Boyce's brand of coercion we do not want to feel manipulated and we resent being tricked by a little girl's false tears. Reuss's 18th century seems very far away. We fancy ourselves more honest and sober and less naive. We say Reuss is Maudlin and David uh, histrionic, so the French history painter. We say the paintings in the Grand Galerie of the Louvre are melodramatic, theatrical and over the top, by which mean we mean that we see their tricks, we are not going to fall for them. To me, this is a desperate situation. So he's saying, do, do we really want to say that the sensitive and versatile tears of the 18th century writers and artists are, being, are things best left to the past? Can we really believe that, this, that their cataclysms of emotion were naive and that we now know better? Unquote. So he's really concerned with this because otherwise we would be cut off from a, a wide range of, of historical images. Um, and Nicola Baun, also a, a, an art historian dealing with Paintings from Victorian times is saying, quote, if we cannot feel sad at a picture of two cold and hungry children, what kind of viewers are we, unquote. But the point is, of course, that a lot of modern art is also being, is also a product of manipulation, calculation, and and uh, and a, a program. So one can, social, re, socialist realist art, like this typical example, is kind of forcing its emotion onto us. Some op art is causing uneasiness or uh, or uh, a sense of anxiety maybe or a sense of, of unpleasant unpleasantness um olaf Eliasson, a, a contemporary artist has also been trying to affect his viewers by manipulating with their brain basically and and surrealism did early on with their uh, um, approaches and so on um, and today we have uh, performance artists like Peter Pawlensky, who has been creating really disturbing uh, performances where he's cutting off body parts or, in this case, sewing his uh, lips together. So, so how come that sentimentality has been left on the wrong side of history, so to speak, when these kind of very engaging and very provocative and very programmatic art forms have not, that we can actually see a range of, not this, of course, but the other the works that are targeting a certain emotion. So I'll leave it to that and open a, a discussion. Thank you.